the next teaching, we've got, there'll be 19 or 20 or so teachings of uh, this class, but this is number session eight, uh, Your New Spirit. And um, I, I just, I really appreciate the feedback I'm getting from many people about how this class is impacting them. It, it really, this, this, the, the truths of this class are so powerful and it, it's life-changing. It really is life-changing. Um, if you have your Bibles, we'll go ahead and start with a couple scripture readings here. 2 Corinthians 5.17, we'll start with what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5.17. I'm sure you've read this before, but it's, it's one of those verses that, unfortunately, the system called Christianity has obscured, and we've become very familiar with this, this scripture verse. But I want us to come back to uh, re really what, what Paul was, was saying here in, in 2 Corinthians Chapter 5, verse 17, and I'm going to read it from the New King James Version, but let me switch to the New King James. I believe I like that version here of this better. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, and I would also say just from Scripture, if Christ is in you, he is a new creation. You are a new creation. If you're born of the Spirit, you are a new creation. Let that sink into you. Don't let the familiarity that has come through the Christian religion rob you of that reality to think you know it, to think I know it. But let the reality of that permeate into your mind, into your thinking, that if Jesus Christ is in you, if the same spirit who raised Jesus Christ from the dead is in you, if you are one spirit with the creator of the universe, you are a new creation. You are not of the old creation of Adam. You are the, of the new creation in Jesus Christ. You are not like those who don't have Christ. Something in you has fundamentally changed when you were born again. A lot of people don't know, okay, what does that mean? What does it mean to be born again? You know, I remember I got saved when I was, I think I was saved in the fourth grade. All I remember, we used to go to a Baptist church. All I remember is we would have these, uh, I really appreciate it, these altar calls every single Sunday morning and Sunday night. You need to get saved. But the ones on Sunday night were really convicting to me. And I remember I was in the fourth grade and the pastor was having an altar call saying that you need to get saved. And man, I tell you, my palms were, were sweating. They were, they were sweating so much. My heart was pounding out of my chest. And I knew, it's like the Lord was just like, you need to get up there. I remember this is in the fourth grade. You need to get up there and get saved. And I did, and I, said, I prayed. And I don't, you know, it's not the prayer that saves you, but I know it was the Lord saving me. But it, it you know, the, the, the change and the transformation that took place, I was a different person, although I didn't always live that way. And my parents would say, well, that's an understatement. But um, I didn't always live that way. But something changed when I was born again. And I didn't even have language for it. I didn't have words for it. But something fundamentally changed. And, you know, a lot of people have said, okay, when I got saved and I got born again, this peace that I didn't have flooded me. Or when I got born again, I had these new desires to do certain things. Or whatever it would be for you that, you know, something happened, but we can't quite put our finger in on what exactly it was that changed when I was born again. And Paul's telling us right now, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. You are a fundamentally different creation than those who don't have Jesus Christ on this earth. And we're going to talk about what exactly changed in the new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now I want to read another verse of Scripture here. Romans chapter 8, verse 10. I'm going to read this from the New American Standard. I believe the New American Standard of this translation is a better translation than the other translations. Romans chapter 8, verse 10. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the Spirit 
Now, in my translation, it's lowercase. I believe that's the right translation. I don't believe he's talking about the Holy Spirit here. He's talking about your human spirit. If Christ is in you, your human spirit is alive because of righteousness. Oh, man, that's incredible. Something on the inside of you called your human spirit is not something. It's your human spirit. When Christ, when the Holy Spirit comes to dwell inside of you, the, the, the spirit of Jesus Christ, who raised Jesus from the dead, raises your human spirit out of death into life. You are alive from the dead. You have already experienced a resurrection if you are in Christ. And what I've found that if you want to experience transformation, the worst way to experience transformation is to always focus on what's wrong with you. You know, I'm a sinner. I'm a hypocrite. I'm, I'm this. I'm that. I, don't, I struggle with this. I struggle with that. You know, my soul, my flesh. I'm not saying there's not a place to focus on, to think about those things, to get correction. But if you constantly focus on what's wrong with you, it will paralyze you. But if you focus on what's right about you, because Christ dwells inside of you, it will move you forward and propel you. If you're tired of being stuck going nowhere, I want to encourage you the greatest way to be transformed is to begin to think about, about who Christ is in you. And we've talked about that over the last three sessions. Christ in you is glory. Christ in you is guidance. Christ in you is power. See, Christ in you is glory, power, and guidance. When we, we, when we broke it down in, in many different ways, but meditating on and thinking on who Christ is in you will transform you, getting your focus off what's wrong with you all the time. But the other two things, were, the, other, the next two sessions, we're going to focus on not only focusing on and meditating on Christ being in you, but also how if you're born of the Spirit. So this message is for those who are born of the Spirit. If you're not born of the Spirit, this does not apply to you. If you have not been born again, this does not apply to you. I'm going to address that later in the message. But if you're not born of the Spirit, this does not apply to you. If you're born of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this applies to you. That not only do we need to focus on who Christ is in us, we need to focus on also how he has transformed our spirit. See, it is your spirit, it is your human spirit that was initially affected by the new birth. Not your soul not your body. Your human spirit is what was affected by the second birth, by the new birth. It's your human spirit, that feeling of peace that you experience, that feeling of joy, that feeling of new desire. What ha actually happened is God raised your spirit out of, the de out of death, and he gave you a brand new spirit. See, you are not a struggling sinner saved by grace. You are a saint who occasionally struggles with sin. See, a lot of us get this mentality like, oh, I'm so terrible, I'm so terrible, my flesh is so ugly and all that stuff. Now, that's probably true. But if you start focusing on all that all the time, you'll miss what God has done. One third, if we are tripart nature, if we're body, soul, spirit, one third of you has already been redeemed, has already been saved, has already been resurrected, has already been alive from the dead. So you are not a struggling, hopeless hypocrite under the weight of condemnation. You are a saint who struggles with You are a saint who occasionally sins. Again, I'm not opening up to hyper grace or any of that stuff. Not, that's not at all what I mean. What I mean is if we will focus on what, how he has transformed our spirit, and we're going to talk about this over the next two weeks, your spirit is now new and regenerated. Your spirit has been resurrected. Your spirit is a partaker of the divine nature. Your spirit is righteous, just as righteous as Jesus Christ. Your spirit is holy. Your spirit is Christ-like. One-third of you has already been conformed into the image of Jesus Christ if you've been born of the spirit. Your spirit is complete. Just, I mean, it, it, it's just amazing. One-third of you has already been saved. 
That in itself is just life-changing and transforming. I'll, I'll never forget I had a conversation like, I don't know, probably 15 years ago, and I'm going to call his name. I'm going to call him Dan. Me and Dan were talking. We were in Starbucks talking, Dan and I. And he, was, he had just read this book, and it was about the new creation and the new covenant, and he was this new creation and the new covenant. He's probably 10 or 10 years younger than me, so he knew it all, or at least he thought he did. And I, but it, he really did. He really uh, sparked some, some interesting questions in me. But he was like, okay, you know, you're not this hopeless hypocrite. And I was under condemnation. I was under just guilt and shame and always just struggling with sin and all these different things. Just always just kind of, Angie can attest to this gloomy and sad and all this stuff. And I just did, I had no revelation of what it meant to be a new creation in Christ, even though I had seen all that stuff for many, many years and growing up. And he started saying, you know, in the new covenant, God's given you a new heart. He's given you a new spirit. He's put a spirit inside of you. And I would always protest and he would always come back. And so, but, you know, I didn't agree with everything he said then. I don't agree with everything he said now. But what it did is it, it put in me this desire, okay, what, to, to really study this, what really happened when I was born again? Because a lot of people don't know. A lot of people, I didn't know. I, I was born and raised in the church. I did not know what transpired when I was born again. And what I've found since then of understanding what has, has changed when I was born again, it changes your life. It really changes your life. Amen. If Christ is in you, your spirit is alive. You were dead, but now you're alive. You have already experienced a resurrection. Yes, there's coming a future resurrection when your body is raised from death and filled with the glory of God at the second coming of Jesus Christ. That's true. But I want you to know, you have already experienced a resurrection when you were born again. You are alive to God. That's why Paul said, present yourselves alive to God. There is a part of you, the three-part nature of man, spirit, soul, body. There is a part of you that has already been resurrected. There's a part of you that is already alive from the dead. And if you will start focusing upon that part of you that is alive, that part of you that is righteous, that part of you that is a partaker of the divine nature, that part of you that is righteous, complete, and holy, and stop focusing so much attention on all, the, all the, the flesh and the soul and all those things that need to die. I'm not saying you don't pay attention to it or acknowledge it, but don't get your focus on it. Focus on Christ in you and how he has transformed your spirit. It will get you off of, the, of what we call in our family the stuck road. And what I mean by that is when Anna was four, and, and she's not in here, she was so cute. And she hates when I say that now, so I can say it, man. She was so cute. No. But it, we were, we were in, a, we got a cabin in Blue Ridge, and Angie was like, okay, it was about, I don't know, 545. It was starting to get dark. And Angie was like, okay, we really need, we were eating at Zaxby's, and she was like, hey, we really need to get going up the mountain road because we don't know if it's up a steep, a steep hill or whatever. And I was like all confident and saying, oh, come on, just relax. You're, you're getting like overworked up about nothing. Just relax, just relax. And it's going to be fine. But anyway, she was right. I was wrong. And we start driving up this hill in the black night. And we get to this incline, and it's a gravel road. And my, our wheels start turning. We're going nowhere. And Anna, she's four at the time. I mean, she was really panicking. She's like, you know, crying and panicking and all this stuff. And, you know, I'm kind of going, oh, yeah, it's, all, it's fine. Everything's fine. We'll get out of this. But I really I was like, I have no idea what we're going to do. And so thankfully, about 15 minutes later, this guy drives up and knew the road. So he came up and got in my car, drove the car up the mountain for me, and got us off that. But, you know, afterwards, if you mention Anne, we, call, we begin to call it the, st the Stuck Road. And if you ever mention Anne of the Stuck Road, you know, she, not now, but back then, she would kind of go into this, this uh, anxiety, would come on her palms and start sweating. But it reminded me of what it's like when we don't know what the way God has transformed us. We're spinning our wheels to nowhere, think we're going up, but we're not making any progress whatsoever. We're on the stuck road, not going anywhere, not making any progress. 
But when you begin to focus on not what's wrong with you, but what's right with you because Christ is in you, because he has transformed your spirit, it will get you off the stuck road and allow you to begin to make spiritual progress in God. See, so many Christians, it's really sad. So many Christians, the lust problem they struggled with 50 years ago, 30 years ago, they still struggle with today. The anger issues they struggled with 10 years ago, they still struggle with now. That all, whatever it would be, the bitterness, the unforgiveness, it, it could be the rejection, whatever it could be, so many different things, they, they continue to struggle in those same areas and they're not making progress because they don't have traction. And what I've found is that until I know my spirit is righteous, my spirit is Christ-like, my spirit is holy, one-third of me, the work of God is already done in one-third of my being, I couldn't make progress. I was spinning my wheels and going nowhere. I was on a treadmill not making any progress. And once I begin to understand, oh, my goodness, I am a new creation my spirit has been raised from the dead. My spirit has been regenerated. My spirit is just as righteous as the Lord Jesus Christ himself. My spirit is, has been conformed into the very image of Christ. And we're going to look at scriptures that support this in the next session. But when I begin to think about that and meditate upon that, I realize, oh my gosh. It, yes, my flesh is filled with sin and death. But what I realize is there is, there is righteousness and holiness and Christ-likeness in my spirit. I am a partaker of the divine nature. I am in union with Christ who is raised from the dead. My spirit and the Holy Spirit are one, and I am a partaker of the divine nature. That doesn't make us a god. It does make us godly. It's, it's powerful. And so when I begin to think about that, of not only what, who Christ is in me, but what he's done to transform, transform my spirit, it was absolutely life-changing. And I, I'm convinced most Christians, this is a sad statement, but most Christians can quote, Christ in you the hope of glory, can quote, I'm a new creation in Jesus Christ, but they have zero revelation of that. And having zero revelation of that, there's no faith to begin to live as a new creation. Because, see, ignorance will block you from living by the life of Jesus Christ, but unbelief will also block you from living from the life of Jesus Christ. You might know it, but you may not believe it. You might, you might know it, but your mind's clouded with all these thoughts and all these accusations, and you may not have faith. Faith is the catalyst. Faith is the key to begin activating the life of Jesus inside of you. So if you don't believe, if you doubt, if you, if you think, well, this isn't true about me, you're going to live in the soul. You're going to live in the flesh. You're going to be ruled and reigned by, over, governed by your flesh. And so it's important that we understand, okay, what transpired in the new covenant. So turn in, turn in your Bibles to Ezekiel 36, verse 26 and 27. Ezekiel 36, verse 26. The Lord's prophesying what would happen in the new covenant. It's incredible. The Lord says through Ezekiel, I will give you a new heart. Did you catch that? Not that, but the scripture. I will give you a new heart. If you're born of the Spirit, God has given you a new heart. I will put a new spirit within you. Your spirit before Christ was dead, dark, and depraved. When you were born again, God raised your spirit up from death in union with Jesus Christ, one spirit with him. When he raised your spirit up from death, you were raised up, united to, and resurrected in life to Jesus Christ. I will put a new spirit within you. 
I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. That's what God did when we were born again. That hardened heart we had, God took out the hardened heart of flesh and gave us a new heart. I will put my spirit within you and I will cause you to walk in my statutes and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. Notice that God says, specifically God says six things. This is in the new covenant. God says six things that I will do. You know, the old covenant was you must. You shall not. You must. All of the emphasis was upon us and what we must do. It was the only thing God could do because before Christ came, the Spirit could not possess us. The Spirit could not dwell inside of us. So in the new covenant, God's commandments were, you must, you shall. You shall not, you must not. Everything, all of the emphasis, all of the burden, all of the responsibility was upon us. That doesn't mean we don't have responsibility in the new covenant. But God does something before he places responsibility on us. Now notice what he says. Six things. I will, I will give you a new heart. Because you can't obey me without a new heart. I will put a new spirit within you. I will remove your heart of stone from your flesh. Number four, I will give you a heart of flesh. I will give you a tender heart. Number five, I will put my spirit within you. And then number six, I will cause you. That's grace. That's the power of God's grace. We're going to have a session on grace. I will cause you, or you could say, I will enable you, I will empower you to walk in my statutes. And then he finally gives us our responsibility and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. You see the change in the new covenant? It's so beautiful, isn't it? The old covenant, you must, you shall. You must not, you shall not. The new covenant is I will, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will, and then you can. It's beautiful. And part of that, part of that, what God does in us is he gives us a new spirit. See, God transforms our inner man. God transforms our spirit. God transforms our heart. So then we're able to do what God commands us to do. But we don't, we don't do it by our own power. We don't do it by our own strength. We do it by the power of God's grace. So let's talk about now what happened when you were born again? What happened when God gave you a new spirit? What is your new spirit? What does it look like? We're going to look at this in Scripture. So let's turn to John chapter 3, verse 7. John chapter 3, verse 7. Where the Lord told Nicodemus, you must be born again. I really, I really wonder how much of the church that we call the church has truly been born again. I don't mean they claim Christian. I don't mean they have mental knowledge that Jesus Christ is Savior. I don't mean they have mental belief that the Word of God is the inspired Word of God. I don't, I don't mean they, they go to church, they read their Bibles, they tithe. But how much of the church has really, truly been born again? See, were you baptized into Christianity or were you baptized into Jesus Christ? See, you cannot save yourself. You cannot make yourself be born again. If Jesus Christ is not in you, you are not going to heaven when you die. I don't care how much you go to church, how much you tithe, how much you read your Bible, how nice you are, how good you are. If Christ is not in you, you are not his. If your spirit has not been regenerated and born again, you're not going to heaven when you die. It doesn't matter, if you're, it doesn't matter how much faith your parents have. 
It doesn't matter how much faith your parents have. It doesn't matter how much you were raised in a godly home. If you have not been born again, you will go to hell when you die. You will not go to heaven. You must be born again. Your spirit must be transformed. Your spirit must be regenerated. Your spirit must become one with Christ. And that's the work God does. But if you don't have Christ in you, you're not going to go to heaven when you die. You must be born again. I think we're seeing so much of the church is just all about, you know, I know I'm talking necessarily about our church, but the church out in the Western world, the church is all about be good and do good. Be a good Christian. Be a moral Christian. Without Christ, without a relationship with Christ, baptized into the church as an organization, baptized into the church as just this massive organization, instead of being baptized into the person of Jesus Christ and being regenerated in their spirit. See, Paul said the litmus test of whether or not you're saved is, does Jesus Christ dwell inside of you? So ask yourself honestly, really, and you ask yourself, does Christ dwell in my spirit? Does Christ dwell? really dwell here, or only am I believing in my mind mental facts? Does Christ dwell in me? Have I been born again? And so what it means to be born again, before you were born again, and it's, it's important that we understand this. In John 3, verse 6, the Lord says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That's the first birth. That's when you were born into this earth as flesh. You were born as flesh. And the Lord said, that which is born of the spirit is spirit. That's the second birth. Notice the part of you that's affected by the second birth. Your human spirit. See, your human spirit is born again. Your human spirit becomes new. Your human spirit is regenerated. That, that's what we want to catch here. The, the, this vital point, the part of your being that was affected by the second birth is your spirit. It did not initially affect your soul or your body. See, before you were born again, you were dead in sin. Your spirit was dark, depraved, and dead, cold, towards God, dead towards God. You still had a spirit. It still functioned. But your spirit was dead to God. You could not commune with God. You could not fellowship with God. Your spirit was alienated from the life of God. But when you were born again, when the same spirit who raised Jesus Christ from the dead came into you, he raised your spirit up from death and gave you life. You are now alive in Jesus Christ. See, you've become a new creation in Jesus Christ. You now have a choice whether you struggle in the flesh, struggle with the lust of the flesh, struggle with anger, struggle with rebellion, struggle with whatever it would be. Uh, you have a choice now because the Spirit of God has come to dwell inside of you. The Spirit of God has power in you and glory in you. And he's transformed and saved your spirit. You have a choice whether to, be, whether to be led by the soul, the mind, the will, and the emotions, or, or rather to be, to be uh, led by the spirit of Jesus Christ. You have a choice. You have a choice. Paul said, Paul said in, in, in Titus 3.5 that he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. When you were born again, your spirit was regenerated. Your spirit is new. Incredible. It's just, you can never, even though this in some ways is foundational, you can never ever graduate from this. It's, it's just so incredible what God did. The second thing God did in your spirit is your spirit is resurrected. Let's look at Romans 6.11. Romans 
Romans 6.11. See, when you, when you meditate on these truths and think about these truths and get them into you, it will bring revival to you. It is almost as if when you start hearing these things, it's almost, if you've been born again for a while, it's almost like you become born again again. You don't become born again again, but it feels like you're born again again because it's like, oh my gosh. Paul said in, in Romans 6, 11, even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin because you were crucified in Jesus Christ, but you are alive to God in Christ Jesus. It goes on in verse 13. Do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead. That's what we do when we come to the Lord. We say, Lord, here I am, your son, your child, alive from the dead. My spirit was dark, depraved, and, and hostile to you. My spirit was alienated from your life, and I come as one who is alive from the dead. My spirit is alive from the dead. Amen. See, when, you know, we, I was talking about this at the beginning. You know, what really happened when you were born again? When I walked down that aisle when I was in the fourth grade, and I gave my heart to the Lord, and the Lord truly saved me, not just by some rote prayer I prayed, not by some baptism, but Jesus Christ truly saving me by his spirit. What actually happened? He called forth my dead spirit up from the grave and raised it up into new life. And when he raised my spirit, I didn't know all this in the fourth grade, but when he raised my spirit up from death, I was raised up in union with his spirit. My spirit and the Holy Spirit, now being one, are connected and joined together. I became a partaker of his resurrection. That is not something that happens, or, or yes, that is going to happen to our bodies when Jesus comes back. But you have already experienced his resurrection if you're in him. You've been raised from the dead. You are alive to God. Your spirit is regenerated. Your spirit is new. Your spirit is alive. Yes, this body is dead because of sin. Yes, the soul and its mind, will, and emotions want to live for self. But your spirit is alive to God. Your spirit is sensitive to God. Your spirit is one with Christ. Never disconnected. Always connected. Alive to God and Jesus Christ. Paul says, listen to this, an apostolic command to us. Romans 6.11, this is an apostolic command. Consider yourselves to be dead to sin but alive to God in Jesus Christ. This is not something, listen, this is not something you just hear on Sunday morning and go, amen. If it's not part of your lifestyle, of the way you live and the way you think, you will not live in the life of God. You will live in the soul. Paul says, under the authority of the Holy Spirit, Consider yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God. Consider, consider yourselves alive. That word consider means to reckon, compute, calculate, count over. It, what it really means is think deeply. This is what Paul's saying. Think deeply. Think deeply upon this fact that you are alive to God in Jesus Christ. Don't just be like, oh, I was saved in the fourth grade and I was raised from death. No, every day or daily or regularly. Think about, think deeply, meditate upon. My spirit was once dead, but is now alive. My spirit was once sinful, dark, and hardened, but now because of the impartation of Christ and his resurrection life, my spirit is alive from the dead. The same spirit who raised Jesus from the dead has raised my spirit up from the grave. His, his life my, from my spirit now radiates resurrection life to the rest of my being. I 
You, we are alive to God in Jesus Christ. Think deeply on it. Leonard Ravenhill said that Jesus had not come into the world to make bad men good. He came into the world to make dead men live. See, you were not saved to become a good person. You were not saved to become moral. You were dead. You were dead in your sins and your trespasses. You were dead and enslaved to sin. But when you were truly regenerated and your faith was awakened and the Spirit of God came into you, He raised your spirit up from death and you are alive to God in Jesus Christ. Amen. Now let's turn to Romans chapter 6, verse, verse 5. Your spirit is a partaker of the divine nature. Paul said, if, if, for if we have become united with him. In other words, he's saying, if you're born again, you have become united with him. And I, I've talked about this in an, in an earlier session. The spirit of God is grafted to your spirit. The Spirit of God is one spirit with your spirit. Your spirit is joined to, fastened, glued to the indwelling Holy Spirit, who is life, who is indestructible life, who is power, who is glory, who is the anointing, who is overcoming victory. Right there in your spirit, you have indestructible life. You are a partaker of the divine nature of Jesus Christ. I'm not sure you're, you're getting that because I would be a lot more excited than you are. <laughs> you, if you're born again, are a partaker right now. Not in the sweet by and by when you go to heaven. Right now, you are a partaker, spirit to spirit, of the divine nature of Jesus Christ. For if we have become united with him, and we have if we're born again, If we become united with him in the likeness of his death, then also we will be in the likeness of his resurrection. Now, we, we talked about this in an earlier session, but just to review here, just because it's so incredible, I just want us to get this, this Greek word, I would encourage you to look it up for yourself in the Blue Letter Bible or whatever software you use. Look up this Greek word, united, because this, if you just think about this, it doesn't have the richness, but if you dig in, it's like, oh my goodness, this word united means implanted by birth or nature. The life of God, when you were born again, the very person of Jesus Christ was implanted into your human spirit in the second birth of joint origin. That means when you were born of the spirit, what is true about Christ, his history and his destiny becomes your history and your destiny. Jesus was crucified, you were crucified in him. Jesus was buried, you were buried in him. Jesus was raised from the dead and your spirit has been raised from the dead already and will be raised from the dead when at his second coming. Amen. Amen. See, what this means is you have Christ's nature implanted into you by new birth. You, have, you are of joint origin with Christ by new birth. You have Christ's nature as part of your innate spiritual nature by new birth. You already are in your spirit like Jesus Christ. That's not heresy. That's scripture. Scripture. That doesn't make us gods. It makes us godly, though. John said, as Jesus is in this world, so are we. 
right now, not when we come back with him. Now, I know I had a whole session on the flesh, the soul, and, and that battle. Uh, so that's not, I'm not saying we don't have that. We have that battle, so I'm not talking about that right now. But in your spirit, the divine nature of Jesus Christ has been grafted and fastened to your spirit. He himself has been grafted and fastened to your spirit. You are a partaker of his divine nature. You already have inside of you the love you need to love God and love others. It's already there. It just needs to be released. You already have the peace you need to deal with difficult circumstances and difficult people. It's already there because he's there. You already have the joy of the Lord inside of you because he's there. And you're one with him. You're one spirit with him. I think we're going to need that as we get darker, closer and closer to the Lord's return and things around us get more chaotic and darker and darker. We're going to need to rely on the joy of the Lord as our joy instead of relying on external circumstances. You already have the joy in you. You already have the peace, the love, the patience. You don't need to pray, God, give me more patience. You need to say, Lord, be my patience because you, in my soul, release your patience outward. You already have the faith of Jesus Christ. Let me say it again. <laughs> me, you. You have the faith of Christ. That's why Jesus said in Mark 11, he could say, have the faith of God. You, that's why Paul said in, second, in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, the life I live, I live by the faith of the Son of God. He wasn't living by his own human faith. He was living by the faith of the Son of God. The faith of Christ that could walk on water. The faith of Christ that could do miracles. The faith of Christ that could speak to a, to a tree and curse it. That faith is already in you. You already are a partaker of that divine nature. The faith of God. Faith of God is meant to become the faith you live by. Overcoming your own soulish doubt and unbelief. Living by the faith of the Son of God. His faith becoming your faith because you are a partaker already by the born-again experience of his divine nature. That's incredible. Isn't it incredible? I'll say that now as much as I say stunning. <laughs> Let's look at 2 Peter 1.3. It's something we've already looked at, but it's so good. We'll just read it again. 2 Peter 1.3. Seeing that his divine power. What is that divine power? It's the power of Jesus Christ in you. His divine power has granted to you everything pertaining to life and godliness. You have everything you need already to live the Christ life, to live that Christ-like life, not you trying to do it by yourself, but Christ in you living out of union with Jesus Christ, out of union with him. That spiritual genetic transfusion that took place when you were born again. His spiritual DNA imparted into your spirit. You have the DNA, the spiritual DNA of Jesus Christ in your spirit. So whatever, as you grow and mature, you naturally grow into his image and likeness. It's the natural way we're meant to grow. The release of the spirit from the inside out has granted. Let your faith wake up. Well, let, your, let me say, let your faith awaken. Has granted everything you need. 
Do you need peace? You have it. Do you need love? You have it. Or I should say, actually, if you need peace, you have him who is peace. If you have love, you have him who is love. If you need joy, you have him who is joy. Christ in you and you join to him, you can do all things through Jesus Christ who gives you inward strength. You can overcome anything that you go through because the overcomer who's already overcome and he sits at the right hand of God has overcome and he's in you and he will overcome through you. That's good news. That, this is the gospel, by the way. It's the gospel. It's the good news. When, when Paul said the gospel, I mean, he meant really good news. Life-transforming news, not for the sweet by and by. I mean, how many of you, it's like, I mean, I, I read this and I'm like, oh, if I would have known this when I was in my 20s and I wouldn't have to struggle for 10, 15 years of trying to live the Christian life. I could just learn this when I got saved. Man, it would have made things so much better. But this is the gospel. You are a new creation. You are a new creation. You have the DNA of Jesus, the spiritual DNA of Jesus Christ. I remember one time I was teaching this and someone misunderstood what I was saying. They said, you're saying we have the DNA of Jesus Christ, not his physical DNA. We're not going to become Jewish, you know, whatever. You know, I'm talking about the spiritual DNA, his love, joy, peace, patience, righteousness, holiness. See, think about this. Ephesians 4.24 says, we have been created in righteousness and truth according to his image. And I think Colossians also mentions that. See, we want to become Christ-like, right? That's, that's God's ultimate intention is to become like Christ, be, con, be, be conformed into the image of Christ. Do you realize one-third of that work is already done, already finished, already completed? One-third of your being is Christ-like. As he is, so also are we in this world. Your spirit is like Jesus Christ. Now your soul and your body are not like Jesus Christ. They're being conformed through the process of sanctification into his likeness, into his image. But you have the DNA of Jesus Christ. I mean, just think about this. You know, Elon Musk, for example. Elon Musk is getting a lot of notoriety now because he bought Twitter and, you know, he's really being a proponent of free speech and things like that. But He's, he's the, the world's richest man. I guess he still is after he bought Twitter. I'm not sure how that all works, but he's the world's richest man, a brilliant mind. Imagine if you had the DNA of Elon Musk, how if you had that DNA, you would begin to automatically, just by nature, begin to grow up and think innovatively, begin to think strategically. And after a while, you would probably become a millionaire or even a billionaire just because you had that DNA inside of you. Or think about this, if you think about uh, Tom Brady, who is called the GOAT, the greatest of all time. He's got, what, seven rings. He broke our heart in Atlanta in 2016. Or maybe, yes, 2016, with the greatest, you know, you, you all know that, 28 to 3 in the third quarter. We had a 99% chance to win. Tom Brady breaks our heart. If you had the DNA of Tom Brady, you would become this incredible quarterback. You would know offensive and defensive schemes. You would be able to throw the ball perfectly. And you would be just in, this incredible quarterback. Now, we have something that doesn't even compare to the DNA of Elon Musk or the DNA of Tom Brady. You have the spiritual DNA of Jesus Christ. Organically, naturally, just by allowing Christ in us to live, organically, we should be growing into his image, growing into his likeness. See, your spirit has received that genetic transmission of Jesus Christ into your spirit. Because he dwells there, your spirit now is a partaker of the divine nature. See, this is not taught. This is not taught, is it? And in, in, in so many churches out there. And, and we've just what we, we've settled for dead religion. We've settled for dead religion. God 
This is the gospel. This is the gospel. See, again, many believers view themselves as struggling sinners saved by grace instead of as saints who occasionally struggle with sin. A saint means a holy one. A saint means one in whom Christ dwells. A saint is one who has been transformed in their spirit by the second birth. See, when we don't know this, and, and we don't renew our mind to this, and we don't believe it, what happens is we'll limp through life struggling, struggling to overcome, struggling to get victory. We'll keep spinning our wheels, but going absolutely nowhere. Your spirit has been transformed. And if you will stop focusing on what's wrong with me, what's wrong with me, what's wrong with me, because you already know what's wrong with you. And if you don't, people will point out what's wrong with you. But if you start focusing on like it, taking the spiritual mirror of God's word and looking at your, yourself in the spiritual mirror of God's word and seeing what's right with you because Jesus Christ dwells in you and he has transformed your spirit, it will, it will radically change your life. Amen. Amen. Lord, I just thank you for this good news. Lord, I thank you right now for the good news of Jesus Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, incredible. This is such good news. May, Lord, we forget this so quickly. Lord, we, we forget this so quickly, Lord. Help us to remember the good news of our spirit being transformed. You have already completed the work that in our spirit. I pray you would open eyes to this. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. We can end the online portion here. God bless you.